Thank you, I'm excited to be here at DockerCon. Um, I really like DockerCon. Um, I uh, went to the first DockerCon and that kind of put me on a trajectory that led me to the company. So I've been an attendee before and it opened new doors for me, so I hope it does the same for you. Um, my name is Jeff. Online I'm Programmer Q, but my Twitter has a three in it, so sorry about that. Um, and I have been a developer support engineer at Docker for about two and a half years. I have seen uh, just about everything and I wanted to share at least the most common things that come up over and over again. So here's kind of the format of what's going to happen today. I'm going to talk just a, for a short amount of time on troubleshooting basics so we can have some terms defined to kind of def so we can talk about what's happening and apply that to each situation. For each of these common issues, I have a few common use cases that mirror what I see both in the community and for Docker's paying customers. And then this last section is a little different because I'm just going to kind of shotgun blast a bunch of different tools, tips, and techniques uh, at the end. Now, before we get too far in, um, I want to talk about troubleshooting. It's like going on an adventure, so if anyone has ever seen Lord of the Rings or played games or read books, you know that when you set out on an adventure and you take that step out your front door, you're going to have some unexpected issues that come up and how you deal with those are, is what troubleshooting is all about. <clears throat> all right, troubleshooting basics. When you run into one of these unexpected situations, the way I think about it is I break it down into these three steps. So the first two are kind of a read-only operation. First, you need to characterize the problem. You can't just start rebooting servers. You have to understand what's going on. You have to look at it. You have to be able to describe it, that sort of thing. Once you have adequately characterized the problem, you should be able to form a hypothesis that is testable. And that hypothesis should be directly related to the characterization you have done. And the last step is when you start making changes. You take that testable hypothesis, you actually try it, and then you see how that affects your characterization and your understanding of the issue. So, uh, common issues and questions. We're gonna start talking about volumes. Uh, I see lots and lots of questions in the community about volumes. So we're gonna talk about Bob. Bob is a community member. He is an enthusiast. He's kind of a power user. He builds things for fun. He's, he's the typical self-taught tinkerer. Now, Bob and his friends want to, to play Minecraft together, so Bob decides to dockerize a Minecraft server. If you've never dockerized Minecraft, that's okay. All you really need to know about it is that it's a single Java process. It stores game state data to disk and it listens for game client connections on port 25565. <clears throat> so with that information, we can write a Docker file. This is a working Docker file for Minecraft. Basically, it just takes the jar file, adds it to the Java image. We set EULA true. Bob accepts the Minecraft server EULA. We have a port exposed, a working directory, and a command that Docker can run to actually start up the Minecraft server. This builds and runs, and we have a working Minecraft server. It's that simple. So Bob and his friends connect, and they start having fun. They spend months and months, hundreds of hours maybe, uh, each building this, this very complex Minecraft world, and they end up with quite the set of creations and the, all, all this building they've done, that's kind of important to them. They're kind of invested. Uh, they've got all the redstone figured out and debugged. And it's great. One day, one of Bob's uh, Minecraft players say to him, hey, uh, we're still on Minecraft 1.10, but Minecraft 1.11's been out for a little while. Let's, let's see if we can take our world that we put so much work into and run a 1.11 server. Bob says, that's no problem. He goes back, edits the Docker file, updates it. It's literally just changing this 10 to an 11 in those two spots. As long as he has that jar file available, it will build and run very similarly. Now, we are stopping the old server <clears throat> because it's listening on the same ports. We don't want a port conflict. So 
they're excited, they fire up this new server, it's running, they connect and they expect to see all their hard work again, but that's not quite right. This is a brand new Minecraft server world. The press E to open your inventory if you've ever opened a world for the first time. Um, that, that's, it's a new server. So Bob's having a little bit of a freak out. This is an unexpected situation. So, uh, so he's facing uh, this, this on this adventure. He says, where did my stateful data go? This is bad. So let's talk about volumes. So Bob didn't use a volume. Volume is really the feature that Docker has written to uh, be the place to put stateful data. The big takeaway here is that a volume really is just a directory. So it's not as scary or secret sauce as some new users feel. It's just a directory on the, the Docker host and Docker uses a, an operating system feature on Linux called a bind mount to take that directory that's on the host and that makes it available inside the container. So a bind mount, here's an example of a bind mount just outside of the context of Docker in case you've never done this. It's kind of like a symlink, it feels like a symlink, but it's not. We're actually using the mount command, this is a kernel feature. So we've got a source directory, a destination directory, and once we make a change on either side, we're accessing the same directory structure on disk. And I've got the inode numbers there at the left to show that the, they really are the same directory structure. It's the same inode. Same timestamps and everything. So um, the reason I'm showing this is to show that there's no synchronization. It's not doing an rsync. It's not copying. Once you make a change, it's just there. So the Docker volume interface really is just a way of specifying this source and destination directory. The destination directory is always some destination in the container. And then the different types of volumes change based on how you want to specify uh, the source directory. So there's, there's uh, three kinds here. There's the host volume, a named volume, and an anonymous volume. And the host volume is what you use if you have a, an absolute path on the system that you definitely want to use. Now the named and anonymous volumes are similar because you're letting Docker decide the fine detail of exactly where that full path is. It just changes based on how you uh, ask Docker for the volume. So here we've got at the top an example of passing a, a full host path. The named volume we actually pass in just a label so we can refer to it really easily later. And the anonymous volume, we still can refer to it later, but it's a little harder. We have to go and run the docker inspect command on the container to pull out the ID of that anonymous volume. Now we might want a host or a named volume if we have data we care about, and we really want to be able to refer to it easily. An anonymous volume is useful if you just need a volume. Maybe it's a test thing and you're going to throw it away really fast, but you want it to be like, um, like a production instance, for, for example. <clears throat> So how should Bob use this information about volumes to get his data into a safe, persistent place? Now, right now, since his data is not in a volume at all, we have to copy it out. If he would have used a volume to begin with, this step wouldn't be necessary, but he did kind of get himself painted into this corner and it's an unexpected outcome. So Bob runs the docker diff command against the container, we, remember we called it old, and that will list all the file system differences on that container uh, that have changed or been deleted or been added since the, um, since, since the container was started. <clears throat> so we can see opt Minecraft has, has a bunch of added files and that's where all our Minecraft data is. So now we can take a volume that we create called Minecraft. We can create the new container and we can specify a volume this time to be at the opt Minecraft location. And then this last thing, we, we're taking a, a data from the old container with Docker CP, so it'll just copy that data right on out to a folder called Minecraft, and then we Docker CP that Minecraft folder in to the new container, and we've copied all our data to the container successfully. So now, Bob can do a Docker start new, and the next time he goes to upgrade, he won't have to do the copy, he can just use, use the same volume again. So Bob now is happy because his Minecraft data is saved and 
he is a volume pro now. Another common volume use case is when you're doing local development. This is Jane. She is a Ruby developer and she's doing development on an Ubuntu 16.04 desktop. And she wants to use Docker in her, in her development workflow. So she takes her code, opens it in RubyMine, and her goal is to have that running code be available inside a container on her machine. And when she hits save using host volumes, since it's the same directory, the container can see it. And she can even use the rerun auto reload gem in Ruby to get auto reload working so she can accelerate development easily. So here's her Docker file. It's a pretty basic Docker file. We're installing a few, uh, we're installing a few dependencies. We're starting from the official Ruby image. We're copying the, the code into the container, exposing a port and doing a command rerun Ruby server.rb and her Sinatra app will run and reload as necessary. Now, she goes to run this and gets this uh, error message from the SQLite gem in her code that says no such table config. And she says, oh yeah, this is the first time running this code for this development environment on my machine. So I need to initialize the schema for this SQLite development database. So she pulls out the command to do that. So it, um, she's got this init.sql file that needs to run and it will put the schema in test.db. Runs the command, but SQLite 3 complains because error attempt to write to read only database. And this is the unexpected situation that Jane has run into. It's a file permissions issue. She's like, I'm working in my home directory. Why do I get permission denied? And let's go characterize this problem. Now, the big takeaway on volume issues like this it's really the same as dealing with file and ownership issues outside of Docker as it is inside of Docker. You have users running processes, you have files owned by users. The really big key thing to keep in mind is that the numeric UID is what matters. Since the container can have a different Etsy password file, the same number can have a different name. So don't get hung up on the fact that it might be owned by Nginx as long as it's UID 1000. It's UID 1000, and that's really what matters. So let's do an LS to figure out what's going on. We have this test.db test file that was created by the Ruby code that we ran a moment ago inside a container. Now we can start kind of checking off different things. This file was created by the container. It's owned by UID 0. If we do a Docker inspect, on the image we created, we can also see that the default user it runs as is UID 0. We can also look on the host system and see that that Ruby process is running as UID 0. The file that it wrote out is permission 644 SQLite that we ran on her workstation is owned as 1000. This is just a regular file and permission issue. So all of these bullet points are ways you can remediate that. I've highlighted the ones I prefer in green and I've done the ones I don't like in red. Um, Chamad 777, don't do it. Um, so I like choning it and then running the container as the user that matches the developer's works, workstation. So you can do that with a Docker run and pass in a dash dash user. Um, some, some images this won't work with, but Jane's pretty basic Ruby Docker file, it, it should handle this uh, relatively well. Uh, other examples of variations on this are the containerized process writing out. We talked about database files. It could write out a PID file. It could be doing bytecode code caching like a .pyo file if you're doing Python development. If you're accepting file uploads, that can write out and end up being owned by the process. And same thing like a WordPress style plugin or theme installation, um, or if it's configured to write out a log file. And it's not always UID zero. So you can get permission denied issues in the container if the container is running as like some crazy UID number and then your host volume is owned by some different crazy UID. So you can't get permission to deny issues going both ways. So it just really boils down to being mindful of the same, having the permissions agree. Uh, there's one more aspect to this that comes up frequently. In the case of 
Jane, she had a Linux workstation was running Docker directly, but a lot of folks run Docker in a VM and their workstation is actually uh, a different host. So you run VirtualBox or Docker for Mac or you run VMware and there's some sort of file sharing mechanism that gets the files from your host into the VM and then from there it, get, it gets bind mounted into containers. So you, with that extra layer you can get new and interesting behaviors. For example, if you're doing VirtualBox shared folders, um, the mount inside the VM is owned by one user, no matter what it's owned by on the host. So that can cause some confusion. Um, it, and then in the case of Docker for Mac, it's actually a little bit nicer. So if anyone's using Docker for Mac, the OS 10 file sharing mechanism it has, it'll always make sure that containerized processes write files out to your Mac owned by your Mac OS user ID and vice versa, anything that your Mac OS user can read on the host will be readable and writable by any containerized process no matter what user that application is running as. So it does some dynamic ownership to make that happen. So it's a really, really good development workflow for developers. Um, I saw a lot fewer volume questions in the community channels once Docker for Mac came out. So that was uh, very nice. So Jane now runs her development environment with the correct user ID and she's happy. She's a volume pro. Next category is networking. There are, I could probably do two talks on just networking issues, but I'm only going to do a, a small portion of this talk on networking. So um, let's get into it. This is Josh. He's a developer at a small company and he's working on a Python web application. So that web application is pretty early, like he just did the git in it today. And it's uh, basically just some stubs. Let's take a look at it. So it's a bottle application and we have one route defined and that route just returns socket.git hostname. This is going to be handy while we're testing since it'll return the container's hostname, which is its ID. And it listens on port 8000. The Docker file for his Python application is pretty similar to the Ruby one. We are starting from the official Python image. We're doing a pip install to get the dependencies. We're adding the code, exposing a port, and we have a command. We can build and run and test this with a Docker build, a Docker run, and a curl command. And there we go. We can see this is running in container D893 whatever. Now, he's got another thing that he needs to dockerize that's a component of this. This is an nginx config file. So he'll have his application and the nginx config file, very common. And since we just tested the application and it worked with localhost colon 8000, let's toss that into this nginx config file and see what happens. Our docker file for the nginx is pretty simple. We start with an nginx official image. We pop that in on top of the default.conf that was there before and it builds and it runs just fine, but our test um, doesn't go so well. We get a 502 bad gateway error, and that was unexpected. I mean, we just did a test, and then we put the same thing in the config file, and what's going on? So let's characterize this. Uh, networking issues, it's always useful to have a map. Uh, once you've worked with a bunch of container issues, you kind of have a mental map, but uh, it also helps to draw it out from time to time. So we've got the local host of the, the, the actual host up on the top, the ETH0 of the Docker host, and then we've got the app.py on the left and the nginx on the right. And each container has a copy of the networking stack. Every container gets a network namespace, which is a full copy of a full networking stack. And we can see we've got app.py running and we've got nginx running, and that's kind of the lay of the land. So we can start using some normal network troubleshooting techniques here and we can run curl in different places and try hitting different locations. So that localhost 8000 that worked on the host, if we try that from inside the nginx container, we get a connection refused. But these other curls work. Um, so let's draw that back on our map. We've got curl from the application, curl from the nginx. That works on these cases, but not 
the localhost 8000 case. So this is enough information that we can make a hypothesis. The localhost upstream we're using is just wrong. We should use the IP of the container because if we look at it, the, it works going from Nginx to the ETH0 IP of the application container. So let's try it. Let's update our Nginx config file and retest and there we go. Lo and behold, we get the same container ID where the application was running before. So we're done, right? No, um, this has got a couple of problems with it still. So we do have the upstream working, but we uh, have a hard-coded IP. I'm an ops guy, I don't like hard-coded IPs, so let's not do that. The other thing here is we want Nginx to kind of be the front man for what's going into the application, so we don't need this port to be published for the application. So let's get rid of that port publish 8000. It kind of causes us some, some problems anyway. The next thing is we need to figure out how Nginx is going to discover this IP automatically. And the way you do that is with the Docker network service discovery. That was added, oh, a couple years now, a couple years ago now. But I still, to, to this day, see in the community people don't know about it, so let's talk about it. It's really pretty straightforward. We've got a virtual DNS resolver running in Docker. It is accessible from a container at 127.0.0.11. It's a special IP. It's in the Etsy resolve of every container that has access to it. And if you try to resolve a dash dash name or a dash dash net alias of any of these containers at that server, you'll get the container's IP. So if we get the web name and pop that into our proxy pass and we uh, Nginx wants the resolver as well, so we'll pop that in there too. We get a working uh, Nginx config file, and Josh is now a container networking specialist. So there's lots of variations on this. Since containers have their own local host, it's easy to fall into these, um, these little pitfalls. <clears throat> Next category, everyone's favorite. Let's talk about a TLS issue that I've dealt with. Um, a few times. So this is Steven. He works at a really big company and they are on the dev he's on the DevOps team um, and he's working on the Docker project. So their DevOps team is tasked with deploying Docker EE, Docker data center and they're employing internal applications as well. So they go and they install universal control plane. And they get it up and running and um, they're, they're kind of testing it out. And by default, it comes with a self-signed cert, so they go ahead and request a certificate. And uh, if anyone hasn't really played with universal control plane, there's just a couple things you need to know about it. So first, Docker is a client server type deal. You have the Docker daemon that listens on, on a, 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 implements an API. The Docker client connects to that API. So if you do a Docker run, you're sending a JSON API request to Docker and then it does a Docker run for you. So Universal Control Plane, it implements all its goodness by also implementing the Docker daemon API and it exposes that on port 443. Now, UCP also has a web GUI so that actually lives on the same port. So we get this kind of interesting thing where we've got the Docker daemon API that's usually just a command line thing and we have a web GUI and the web GUI actually talks to Docker daemon API as well. Now, if I want to use a regular Docker command line client like Docker or Docker Compose, I can. So UCP has this feature called the client bundle and that has the environment variables and the certificates. It needs a client certificate and a it needs the ability to trust the certificate that the server presents it with so that it can do stuff. So let's take a quick look at a client bundle. So we've got a ca.pem, that's the certificate authority that the UCP server presents. And then cert.pem and key.pem, that is the client certificate that the local command line tool can present so that the server knows who you are. And then we've got the TLS verify yes cert path so the client can find the certs and the Docker host so it knows where to connect. 
So this works. We can do source env.sh, we do a Docker run, and UCP actually will do its magic. It'll pass it on to another Docker daemon, and we get a container. Uh, same thing works with any other Docker command. Docker service create goes through UCP in this way. Now, remember, we also have this web GUI, and so far, since it comes with a, a self-signed client certificate, or a self-signed certificate, uh, web browsers are putting up this lovely warning, which no one likes. So remember, he requested a new certificate. It's been delivered. He has three files, and he's going to go install it in Universal Control Plane. So it's got a private key, which he has, so he can put that right there. He's got server certificate, which he has, so he can put that right there. And then he's got something called bundle, so he just tosses that in the CA certificate box. So he hits update, it says success, he downloads a new client bundle so that the ca.cert is correct, and he retests. Chrome is happy, no more TLS cert error, and Docker run, Docker service, all those things, they still work the same. But then he gets a report. Uh, they say, hey, Stephen, I am getting a TLS error. And he's like, oh no, TLS error. Everyone's favorite uh, issue to troubleshoot. He says, all right, tell me about it. Is your browser working okay? Is your Docker client working okay? Yeah, yeah, those are fine. It's just Docker Compose. If I run a Docker Compose, I get the certificate verify failed. And we had lots of folks run into this, so that's why it's in my presentation. So it's working in the browser. It's working in Docker CLI, but it's not working in Compose. Now, Steve, unfortunately, has dealt with a few TLS issues before. So he's thinking, well, Compose is written in Python, and the Docker command line client is written in Go, and Chrome uses who knows what library. TLS libraries tend to have different opinions on how they establish trust. So maybe something about how he installed the certificate is just not making the Python TLS client 100% happy. So let's test that out. Uh, Steven has this handy dandy checklist, cheat sheet, sorry, and Anytime he has a certificate trust issue, let, he just kind of mentally goes through this. So first thing is, do we have the DNS matching the subject or the alt name? And the answer is yes. If, if not, then Chrome or Docker CLI would not be happy. So we can check that off. Next thing is the full chain of trust. And for this, we have to actually kind of look at each cert individually. So let's do that. So that first certificate that he has, the server certificate itself, it's got a subject of ucp.example.com, which is good. And it was issued by this thing called Let's Encrypt Authority X3. So he's like, all right, let's look for the certificate with the subject, Let's Encrypt Authority X3. By the way, um, just as an aside, this OpenSSL x 509 out text it has saved me a bunch. I know it off the top of my head. Learn it, and this stuff is way easier. So the... Next cert, he has the one that was just labeled bundle, subject, Let's Encrypt Authority X3, so good, we have the right cert. And it has another issuer here, DST root CA X3, but that's all the certs he has. So that means we don't have a complete chain. Now fortunately, certificate authorities like to make their certificates available, so this is just like a quick Google search. And he found the certificate and was able to download it. You can also pull it out of your uh, operating system's trust store or a web browser's trust store. It's probably there. So he pulls that out. We've got it now. And we can show that we have the full chain of trust. So it's just a subject issuer, subject issuer. So since my web browser trusts the root, and that root certificate issued this intermediary, and this intermediary issued my certificate, the web browser says, yes, I trust it. So now that we have the full chain, let's go and put that back into these three boxes that we have in the UCP admin interface. Private key is still the same. CA certificate is actually where the DST root CA X3 cert goes. It goes exactly one certificate by itself. And then server certificate is where the other two go. And I always do actual certificate and then intermediary, but I have had reports that with some chains you need to have the reverse order. So now we ha can check off that we have that full chain of trust, but our client bundle still has the intermediary as that ca.cert. So let's generate a new client bundle 
and we can check that one off as well. So we retest compose and we have source m.sh, docker compose up dash d and we have a working compose. So Steven has saved the day, the developer is happy and he's a good ops person so he goes and retests the other things in the system. He's got the browser and the docker CLI and those still work so um, everything's good. So we learned that the Python TLS client, it really wants this full chain to be present even though not every TLS client has that same opinion. So it's just a rule of thumb. There probably are some situations where it doesn't apply, but almost every situation that I've encountered something like this, using the full root chain all the way to the cert is good. <clears throat> so we've got Steven, he's now a TLS pro and we'll not have to worry about this until certificate renewal time. All right, last section, advanced troubleshooting techniques. This is Amber and she's the spellcaster. She can fix anything. She's at a big company too and she's the lead DevOps person and she has worn a lot of hats. She's been a sysadmin, she's been a developer, she's been a network person, she's done all this stuff. So let's look at how Amber approaches troubleshooting in the Docker community and, and what tools she kind of has to characterize issues. And it starts with a big long list of command line tools. So there's a lot of APIs in Docker, there's a lot of network stuff in Docker. SoCat I have at the top because it's the lowest level tool. We've got uh, the ability to take uh, something from one place and move it to another in a bi-directional manner so you can do interesting things with that. That will be the next slide. Curl and JQ are also handy because we've got a lot of HTTP APIs. Curl is perfect for working with HTTP and then a lot of the APIs are JSON. So we've got JQ which is a command line utility to build or interpret or filter the um, JSON objects. I've got a big long list of network tools. I probably left a bunch out. Um, those are going to be handy again because we see a lot of networking happening in Docker so there are networking issues that you, tr that you have to troubleshoot in Docker. Finally, there's this nsenter command and uh, nsenter is written by Docker's very own Jerome and it allows you to enter the, an arbitrary Linux namespace. All those other tools I listed and probably a bunch more are in this Netshoot container by Docker's very own Nico. He's, um, he's uh, one of my coworkers. He's, uh, and they're both my coworkers and they're both fantastic. I work closer with Nico than with Jerome, but okay. Let's look at SoCat. So I want to see what is happening with this Docker API thing. So this whole client server thing is going on, some issues happening, and I think it has to do with how the, the client request is happening. So let's use SoCat to put that in the middle of the client and the Docker daemon. <clears throat> so SoCat has lots and lots of options. I could probably do a whole presentation just going through the man page, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, so I've just got two options here. I'm doing a TCP listen and I'm listening on 5566 on localhost. I just picked a port above 1000 randomly. And then normally you would run this in one terminal and run this Docker command in another terminal. That SOCAT-V says any traffic that comes in or out in this bi-directional manner, go ahead and print it out. So that's handy. And then the other side of this bi-directional pipe is unix connect var run docker.soc. So that's where Docker listens to uh, listens for API connections by default. So um, if we run that SOCAT command in one terminal and run the Docker command in another terminal, this is the sort of thing that you'll see pop out. So there's the Docker client sending its request headers uh, with an empty body and then we see, see the beginning of the response back from the Docker daemon. So if you want to know really, really, really how does this API work, you can do that. So another combination that's fairly powerful is this curl and JQ combination. So if you have a new enough curl, if you do a brew install curl on macOS, I think you're good, but Red Hat 7's curl I don't think does this. You can connect to a Unix socket. So you can curl directly to the Docker daemon. If you have an older curl, you can actually use SoCat to re-expose it and then curl that. 
Um, and then you can use JQ's crazy filtering language to look at the data you care about. So here, this is a quick little Docker PS type thing, but with JQ printing only the names of the containers on this system. Um, curl and JQ together on the Docker socket are interesting. There's some debug endpoints that, on, that Docker exposes that you can't normally uh, use with the Docker command line client. So if you can do this and do like slash debug slash pprof, you can get a, a golang pprof dump if you're in debug mode. Um, another place that the curl and JQ combination come in handy is if you're working with a Docker registry. So that's another JSON API. You can actually push and pull a Docker image with just curl and JQ and bash. So NSenter is kind of this weird beast. So there's lots of different types of namespaces. There's PID namespaces, network namespaces, mount namespaces, and I don't remember the other two because I don't use them very often. Um, but here at the top, we're grabbing the PID from doing a Docker inspect on a container. So we see the PID of the containerized process on the host. And then we're passing that into the NS Enter as the target PID. We're entering the network namespace. And you can actually see what the IP tables rules are for that namespace. So if you've ever wondered what a container's IP tables rules are, there you go, they're empty. <clears throat> Now, you can also use this to um, insert your own rules if you want to get really crazy. So I didn't tell you that, though. Um, this middle thing is also interesting. You're entering first the mount namespace of the Docker daemon, and then you're using it at center again to enter the namespace of the ingress network. And then this IPVS ADM tool routing mesh is IPVS. So if you've ever wondered where the routing mesh rules are stored, you can go look at that on a swarm mode host and see where all those IPVS rules are. So this is a fun one. And then on the bottom, I'm kind of repeating the same thing, but I'm iterating over every namespace that Docker has. And there's really three kinds of namespaces. There's the ingress namespace, each container has its own namespace, and each network has its namespace. So you can see the IPVS rules in an overlay network, you can see the containers actually connected to the bridge in each bridge network. Lots of cool stuff here. You can do lots of cool characterization. You can TCP dump from these namespaces. Very fun. This next thing isn't a tool so much. It's just a, a trick I use every once in a while. And it has helped out when I'm just totally unsure about what is wrong. So I've got two hosts. I've got host A and I've got host B. And they should be the same but host A has something that's different or broken. We'll say container networking isn't working just in general. So how do you identify what's going on? Like if I just look at the IP tables output, they both look okay, but they're not, it's something still isn't right. So I run IP tables dash save on both hosts and use a graphical diff tool. In this case, this is Vim diff and your eyes are kind of drawn to what's different. The host on the left is running more containers. We see more rules about that. Timestamps are different, that's okay. And then, oh, there it is. We've got a drop policy on a forward table that is different from the accept policy that on the working host. That's probably enough characterization right there to say, hey, I, uh, I think that this rule needs to be updated and that'll be your test and observe. The last reason that Amber is really good at troubleshooting is she's an effective communicator. So she's got this kind of mental map of what asking a question looks like, and this feeds into this troubleshooting method. It starts with a statement of what you're seeing in plain language, proper grammar, uh, complete sentences. It's not assuming, it's just factual. Next, you're going to show just enough evidence to kind of show why you might be thinking that. And then last, you're gonna have a question. You're, if you're asking for help, you need a question. So this feeds into the characterization and the hypothesis. And I, the hypothesis is the question because you don't wanna just state like it sounds like a fact because it's a hypothesis. You still need to go through and actually do it and test it. Um, just a quick little example I thought of real quick. 
maybe she's dealing with something and some upstream component is returning a 502. Normally, that only happens when they're doing their Tuesday deploys, but it's Wednesday. So she might contact the PM and say, hey, I'm seeing a 502. Here's the curl output. It has the curl dash V, so it has the full IP address information that it's connecting to, the headers, everything there, the full URL. And then the question is, is there a deploy happening now? And if the answer is yes, then that's that. If not, then the person she's asking will have enough context and go, oh no, I should look into that. <clears throat> so this works really well for short form Slack, email, maybe a forum post, um, kind, of, kind of try to condense it down and go from there. The, la uh, the last thing that she does and I do and you should do too is if you really want to be really good at troubleshooting issues is practice, practice, practice. And we've got a huge community here at Docker in the wild. We've got the Docker forums. We've got the Docker community Slack. People ask and answer questions there all the time. You can kind of hang back and watch and see what people are doing, what problems they're running into, what the answers are. If you run into a problem yourself, you can ask, or better yet, you can actually actively answer. And the more you do that, the better you'll get, and the more you'll recognize these patterns and be able to be adventurous and handle these unexpected situations. Um, thanks for coming. I appreciate you listening. Uh, so uh, Jeff said that he doesn't want to answer questions up here because it's going to be hard to answer troubleshooting questions. He's not going to help you troubleshoot your system right now. Uh, but if you have more general questions, I think he'll make himself available outside or around or at Moby Mingle. Um, I think it was a great talk. I didn't. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Send me a Mo Moby Mingle if you have a specific question. I have an offer out that says troubleshooting tips from a support engineer Q&A. Send me a thing. I don't have a ton of slots, but I would love to help anyone that I can.